going to uh, start lecturing here on chapter one and there's only going to be a few things out of chapter one that you're really going to kind of be responsible for so it's kind of bounce around a little bit and then really the uh major stuff will you know be chapter two and on but there are some stuff in here that we do need to kind of talk about and sort of discuss uh so chapter one is a little bit about chemistry and it's also sort of a little bit of a a review on some just some basic math stuff and calculation type of stuff and you know how to carry on some of those calculations they also talk about scientific notation in here which is a really important thing and something that a lot of people don't know how to correctly do per se and really don't know how to correctly do it with a calculator and we're going to talk about you know how to properly punch these things into your calculator so that you know, hopefully you do get the right answer so let's get started a little bit about chemistry. Chemistry really does sort of impact all areas of our life um, from things obviously like you think about just research, medicine and those type of things. But, you know, our daily life as well, um, things like food scientists, right, or uh, cosmetics, makeup and all those type of things. Uh, there's really a lot of chemistry that sort of happens in all those areas. And one of the main things that chemistry and what we sort of look at in terms of chemistry is really the study and composition of matter, really. And when we talk about matter, matter really is what everything is pretty much made of. So matter is really anything uh, that has mass, and occupy space. Well, that's pretty much everything uh, that you could think of. And a lot of what we deal with in chemistry is really how matter changes and very common ways that we look at something uh, is really the state of matter. And when we talk about the states of matter, there really is sort of three different states of matter that we uh, come across and let's talk about those three states of matter. Uh, we have really the solid state of matter. And in the solid state of matter, we have everybody pretty much piled in there, atoms, molecules, really sort of tight to one another. Uh, they're not moving around a lot. They don't have a lot of energy. They just sort of lock into place. And that's why when we think about solids, right, they're hard, they're rigid, they're hard to change. And that's because pretty much nobody has energy and they just kind of lock together in that solid phase. Now, we also have the liquid phase. And in the liquid phase, we still have everybody relatively close to one another, but they do actually have a lot more energy than they do in the solid state. They actually have enough energy that they can kind of move past one another. And that's why when we think about liquids, right? They pour their fluid, right? So you're able to pour them because they have more energy. They're able to sort of pass one another. They're not really able to completely break away from each other, but there's a little bit more energy that allows them to sort of move around. The last state of matter is the gas state. And in the gas state of matter, bless you, this is where everybody has completely broken apart from one another. They're flying around. They have a lot of energy, obviously, as they're flying around. As we'll talk about when we get to the gas chapter, that's basically what accounts for pressure that we associate with gases. As they're flying around, there's collisions. As these collisions occur, it increases the pressure. Now, we oftentimes in chemistry will look at the different states of matter uh, when we look at reactions and what's taking place. And a very common sort of thing that we look at in terms of matter is the change of state. So for example, as we go from solid to liquid, that is the process of, what is that? You have something as solid ends up as a liquid, what happened to it? It started to, yeah, you take an ice cube out, right? And it starts to melt, right? So that is the process of melting. 
you feel bad about your melted ice cube, right? It's now liquid water. You put it back in the freezer so it can then freeze, right? Go from liquid back to solid would be the process of freezing. As you go from liquid to gas, that is the process of evaporation or vaporization. And if you were to take gas back to the liquid state, uh, that is the process known as condensation. You could also take something from the solid, skip that whole liquid mess and go directly to the gas. That is a process known as sublimation. Perhaps you're familiar with it. Maybe you have seen dry ice before. Dry ice goes from solid to gas, no liquid cleanup. Dry ice, by the way, is not water. It is actually carbon dioxide, yeah? Super cold as well, yes? It actually jumps across into the gas phase. You also can go from gas directly to solid, skipping the liquid part. Perhaps you remember DVDs and CDs, yes? They're shiny. <laughs> Not you could Google it, um, but that's how they get them shiny. They actually do a process known as deposition. They deposit a bunch of metals on them and they get all shiny. And that is what is known as deposition. So a lot of what we look at in chemistry has a lot to do with these sort of changes of state for matter. Um, in addition, not only sort of the changes of state, but energy a lot of times is associated with a lot of chemical processes that we look at, chemical reactions that we look at, even changes of state. So for example, if I went from the solid to liquid to gas state, I started as solid, went to liquid, went to gas, would I need to put energy in to do that or take energy out to do that? You would have to put energy in. So if you just think about the simple example of the ice cube that comes out of the freezer, with that ice cube sitting on the table, it's collecting all the energy from the surrounding air, right? And that's what's causing it to melt. When you have liquid water and you put it up on the stove and you wanna make some pasta, you put a fire under it, usually if you have fire or electric, whatever you wanna do, and you heat it up, right? And you add heat to it, it starts to boil. And when it starts to boil, right? It goes and starts to have steam, which is basically uh, the evaporation of liquid water, right? Into steam. So all of those processes, as you go from solid to liquid to gas, those are all processes that absorb energy. And in terms of energy and when energy is absorbed, in chemistry, there is a word for that, and that is usually what is referred to as being an endothermic process. So anything that's sort of an endothermic process is a process where overall heat and energy is being absorbed maybe by the system, the surroundings, whatever it may be. Now, obviously, if we were to roll the other way, if we were to start in the gas, we go to the liquid, we go to the solid, those should be all processes where energy is being released in this case. And if you think about gas molecules, right, they're flying around really fast, which means they have a lot of energy. And if you release that energy, they start to fly around a lot slower. So when they come upon another gas molecule, they stick because they don't have enough energy to escape. It gets a little sticky and then they go for a swim down into the liquid phase. And if you continue to take out that energy, like put it in the freezer, then they actually stick a little bit more and they no longer have energy to pass each other and they end up in the solid state. So as we go from gas to liquid to solid, those are all processes which will require energy to be released. And when energy is released, those are processes in chemistry known as exothermic. So exothermic processes are those processes where overall energy is released. When we talk about energy, there is what is referred to as the law of conservation of energy, uh, which basically means we think about energy as sort of a perfect exchange, if you will. And what I mean by that is if somebody releases a certain amount of energy, 
somebody else will pick up the exact same amount of energy. So for example, uh, the surroundings is releasing all the energy to the ice cube. That ice cube is picking up all that energy and it's, it's requiring it to melt. If you lit a match, right? Match is going to be given off lots of energy, right? And the surroundings will pick up all that energy. So the actual flow of energy from one sort of spot to the next uh, is conserved. It's really, if you had a numerical value, a number for it, it is the same number. Uh, but oftentimes we represent the sign of that number as being either positive or negative to represent it being exothermic or endothermic. So in general, as you go through chemistry, if you ever see any type of energy sort of value given to you, and it's a positive energy value, that usually means that it is a endothermic type process. And if it's calculated energy and it's usually a negative value for energy, uh, that usually means that it's an exothermic process and heat and energy is being given off. Any questions on that there? Yeah. Sublimation? Yeah. Other questions? All right, so I do have a question. So um, what is my question? Does melting and freezing, does it occur at the same temperature or different temperatures? It actually occurs at the same temperature. So melting and freezing actually occurs at the same temperature. For example, same thing here, evaporation and condensation also occurs at the same temperature. So for example, water, liquid water or water in general, it will freeze at zero degrees Celsius and it will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. So at 100 degrees Celsius, water boils and at zero degrees Celsius, it freezes. That is sometimes referred to at the zero degrees Celsius as the freezing point and also the melting point because it actually occurs at the exact same temperature. So if you for, to find yourself at zero degrees Celsius for water, let's draw a flat line, say this side is liquid and this side is solid, you would have at exactly zero degrees Celsius, both things happening at the same time. So you have like ice crystals, some solid ice, which is solid water. You have a little bit of liquid water sort of happening. It's really not until you get it a little bit above zero degrees Celsius that you actually get full water, if you will, or liquid. And it's not until you get a little bit below zero degrees Celsius that you really have ice. But exactly at zero degrees, which is this melting and freezing point, you basically have both phases happening at the same time, sometimes referred to as being in equilibrium with each other. You got both things basically happening at the same time. And what determines what will happen at that point is actually the energy part of it, right? So if I'm at zero degrees Celsius and I continue to put heat and energy in, what will happen? It will start to melt, right? If I put energy in, like my ice cube, it's going to continue to melt, right? And it will go off into the liquid phase, right? If I'm at zero degrees Celsius, I take energy out by like putting it in a freezer, right? What happens when you put something in a freezer, right? It actually releases all that energy, right? To the freezer. And that will then allow it to go to the solid phase. So right at those melting points and freezing points, it's really dependent on what you do with energy as to sort of which way you'll go. But when you're dead on that point, you actually have both things sort of occurring at once. Same thing over here, like I said, with uh, sort of our condensation and evaporation, uh, it does occur at the same temperature. And that's the normal boiling point of a substance. So at 100 degrees Celsius for water, you have exactly both of those things happening at exactly 100 degrees. You got some liquid water, you got a little bit of steam happening. By the way, that's what happens at the surface of any liquid. You got some molecules jumping out into the gas phase. You got some guys dropping back to the liquid phase. That's why when you put liquid right on the bench, a little drop of it, it eventually does what? It evaporates, right? And it evaporates because at the surface of that liquid, you have liquid molecules jumping to the gas phase and you have air. The air molecules blow the liquid away so it can't come back into the actual liquid part. In an ideal situation where you don't have air flowing around, 
stuff will jump out of liquid, stuff will come back to liquid. They'll just keep going back and forth at the surface. But in an open environment like this, right, when you have a little guy, you got those guys jumping out, but the air blows them away. So there's nobody coming back in. Everybody is jumping out of the liquid, right, into the gas phase. And that's why when you have a little bit of liquid, it evaporates relatively quickly, right, if you just kind of leave it. That's why if you take liquid and you put it like into a beaker or a, a, a beaker or a container and it has a lot of liquid, it takes a lot longer for that to evaporate away, right? Because only the surface could kind of do that. There's a lot of water underneath, but because it's spread out over here, you have a greater rate of evaporation and that's why, you know, it will sort of evaporate. So the normal boiling point is where we do see that occur. And again, same deal. If you continue to put heat and energy in, in the example of the water, it will go from liquid water to steam, which is the gas version of, of water. And if you continue to remove the energy at that point, it will go the other way. So a lot of things that we talk about in chemistry deals with really the different sort of states of matter, uh, the transition from one state of matter to the next, and energy is a lot of times a really key component to a lot of things that we look at in terms of reactions and what is going on, um, both chemical reactions um, and also physical type reactions. By the way, all these things here, as it goes from say solid to liquid to gas and backwards, they're what are considered physical type changes. Because if I have ice, I have liquid water and I have steam, they are all H2O, yeah, they're all water. They're just in different phases. There's actually no chemical reaction happening. It's a physical change. It's still fundamentally water in all three of those phases. And that's why sometimes people think, oh, it's a chemical change when you start boiling water and you got the steam, but it's not. It's really just a physical change because, you know, it's still water. Steam is H2O, liquid water is H2O, and ice is H2O. So it's all fundamentally the same thing. Any questions on that? All right, we will lay it up there.